How do you manage risk? How do you weigh risk? I hate risk. You right. Know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when you do dry lips, you take a risk. I know you have subscription base who are friendly to you and will forgive you the occasion, but how do you weigh a risk when well, you see a choice of a show? There's, there's one risk in the theater that you cannot take into account up front. There's no way to predict it. And it starts with the C word. And it's as dangerous as in the general public, which stands for a different thing. But in the theater, it's called critics. I want to speak about critics, yes. OK. Yes. Critics think they're benign. They don't think that what they have to say really matters, except that if they praise your show, they very seldom can sell tickets. And if they damn your show, they'll make sure that you never sell a ticket again to it. Uh, it's a strange phenomenon. But it has to do with how we value our time. If we're warned off, even though we think we may not listen to critics, we tend to avoid the movie that didn't get the good review unless it's something that we're just absolutely fascinated with and then we ignore the critics. But for the most top part, we just don't find the time to get there before it leaves the movie house. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my father spent most of his time thinking of how could he bulletproof himself from the critics and get to the point where the public had a choice. And that was called subscription. Right. And he was willing to give you a discount if you bought up front and give you the best seats. And then he protected you by accepting that if, you, if people didn't buy the tickets at regular price or at more than you paid, that he would not discount below your cost to fill those seats. He'd rather let them sit empty. And he had a, a fixed period of time in which the, this, the subscription ran, so he knew that he was at risk for six weeks, or whatever that period was, depending on the size of the subscription. And over the years, he was able to build the subscription. Right. And we've held on to it, and it's been a very important element because it allows us to go out and do some adventurous things, and even some of the things that you think might be safe, but in the end aren't all that safe. Um, but I would say that, that it was a critical review that caused the demise of railway children in a period shorter than I had expected really? or hoped for. Wow. Now, radio, railway children had more people buy tickets to it than any other straight play that I know in the history of the city. And it was done in extraordinary risk because it wasn't done in a conventional theater. It, it, they added the level of risk of you having to find the place and buying a tent. And I was an investor in that show, which is why I'm able to talk this intimately about it. Right. Um, but I think that if it, it had generally very good reviews, uh, you know, it, it had a respectable run, had a very large audience for a straight play. I'd say more than, uh, I'm pretty sure, more than any other straight play in the history of the city. Uh, and. Uh, I went to the last performance, uh, extraordinarily appreciative audience, but I would have thought, based on my experience of having seen it in London, that it would have done better. And so that was a great risk. Those producers took that risk. It was very brave of them. One of them was a young new producer here in town who produced you know, other, Rob Richardson. Yeah. Uh, one was the English producer. I was one of the investors in it, but not the only one, and I did their marketing and advertising for them under contract. So I had a look at what was involved, and it was an extraordinarily complicated piece to do. They brought a train mm -hmm. from England, uh, you know, and uh, I think it enriched the city. Do you think we're time. in a particularly difficult, critical environment in Toronto compared to, I mean, let's look I at New York, let's look at Paris, let's look at London. I don't think it's ever been any easier or harder than it is. I think it's always been the same. Uh, I actually like the critics that we have. I, I think that hardworking, do what they do, uh, and that's their job. And I really don't have an opinion negatively or positively. Sometimes they're extraordinarily helpful. Uh, sometimes they're extraordinarily destructive. But uh, critics uh, have a... Uh, they, they like to think that they're benign because it allows them to write freely. And they sometimes have things going on, as all of us do, in their lives that can sour you when you sit down. And unlike me, if they don't like the piece, they can't go to sleep. 
you know, <laughs> they aren't allowed to sleep in the theater. I don't like to sleep in the theater, but they, they have to stay awake and watch it all. And then they have to say something, and they see everything. And when they see everything, entertaining them is much more difficult than entertaining the public. And they have to guard against saying, I saw this performance ahead of Gabler with so-and-so four times, and that one was had this special thing. You know, like, they mustn't be know-it-alls, and they mustn't know too much. But at the same time, they're taking all their life's experience, just as when I look at a picture, only now they're translating it to other people, and they're influencing other people. And they don't always want that responsibility, but their needs are different than the general public. They, and sometimes they remember that their job is to speak to the general public. And in the general public will be some very erudite people, very mm -hmm. aware people. It's not a question of, of not speaking at the level of what you want to say, but it is to remember that, that there are many ways of seeing things and what we bring to it is a part of the performance too. It's not just what the people on stage are doing. We are the fourth wall right. and we are a part of the show. Uh, we're in the same room living and breathing with those people and they sense us and they respond to us in their performance. And so we have to understand that when we're writing about them and understand that we're a part of the performance too in, in, in that essay that they're writing. And some, so, of the and some of them are very good. Some yeah. of them are very helpful, very thoughtful. Yeah. And sometimes they criticize things that I think are good. And I say, you know, you could see it from that point of view. That's another way to see it. It's not mine. But okay, well, now how do we sell this? Let's mm -hmm. let's get on with our job. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our job to do. It's not. But I I find that morals and newspapers, in general, are put at to the test in many instances. And so, w the way one person sees life and thinks is a moral activity and the right behavior is not always the way other people see it. The critics don't sell tickets. You have to right. remember that the end, that the, the critics can only kill you. They can't help you. Very once, every once in a while, they can help you. They helped me with Slava's Snow Show. My audience came out very confused at that show. And after 20 minutes, and if they stayed the 20 minutes, there were always, in the first three days, there were always 30 or 40, 40 of them waiting at the box office asking for their money back, not wanting to go back in. And then the critics came out and they said the brilliance of Slava to use Karl Orff's music, the Hitler's favorite musician for youth, uh, you know, as a, 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 a symbol of oppression in Russia, you know, uh, and we had great reviews and suddenly everybody shut up until two weeks before the end when Rick Salutin wrote an article saying there's more of Mervish's murky abstract taste. <laughs> and then everybody was able to write me a letter again. <laughs> so you keep all these letters? I do. Somewhere they're in a box. And, you know, and, uh, wow. and, and so uh, I thought, okay. It would be fun to put together a document and then of outrageous letters, both pro and con, to shows in Toronto's history. My father used to take the reviews when the critics, one critic would praise a piece and one would damn it, and he'd blow them both up and put them on the front of the Royal Alex Theater and say, did they see the same show? Yeah. You know, because there is a certain amount of sometimes that happens, but sometimes a consensus forms too. You know, the critics are not consistently wrong, uh, and they're not consistently right, but they are another voice. What has happened to the critics is they've Learn, they've ended up sharing their power with the internet. Now everything goes viral from the first uh, preview. So people come out, and I saw a young lady uh, you know, outside, and I said, what are you doing? And she's twittering. I'm telling all my friends. I was at the opening of Billy Elliot, and I'm standing next to a young lady, and she's busy with her phone, and I'm saying, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm your official Twitterer on the red carpet. 
Elton John has just arrived and I'm telling 4,000 people so they can tell another 100,000 people that Elton's here. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so we're in a different world. Mm -hmm. And what happened with We Will Rock You is that we had three or 400 reviews by our audience posted on our website before the show ever got reviewed. Right. And, uh, and that was what subscription did and still does. This is another bulletproof method. Yes, it means time passes. The first two weeks, the, everyone remembers the critics. The third week, the public takes over. They've had now four weeks of seeing it, a week of previews, three weeks of running, and they're telling people what they think. And they either are agreeing with the critics or disagreeing. So I, I think that Carrie Fisher's show is very special. Uh, we're in the last week of it now, and it's done quite well. But it's a show that the subject matter, on first hearing it, will stop some people from coming because they just feel they don't want to engage in that. They don't realize what a clever, witty woman she is who has survived an enormous, really challenging set of experiences and come out of it very creatively with some interesting obs observations on life. And so uh, those people who have gone have told people, and I've seen my business grow through the six weeks, uh, which is wonderful. But I wish it had been full every seat from the beginning because she deserves it. 